You're listening to the Wonder Women of Aviation. Oh my god, what kind of dog is that? It's a, it's, she's like a mini husky. <gasps> we have a Malmute. <laughs> she's, oh. and she's a Pomsky, if I can get her to show up. Here, oh there. my god, she's so beautiful. I, yeah. They're amazing. Like I love like wolves and dogs like Patrick and I. Yeah, we, we absolutely we love our, our Malmute. <laughs> Oh, how cute. All right, today, well, welcome to the Wonder Woman of Aviation. My name's Natalia. Today, we're speaking with a true Wonder Woman of Aviation. She's not only a role model for both men and women, but she's also known as the first lady of aerobatics, which is something that I learned. Thank um, you. We're speaking with Patty, Patty Wagstaff. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Patty, I, I just- My ocean spot, as you can see behind me. <laughs> I'm close. I'm actually it. really close to the ocean, but I'm not actually on it. Well, you are in Florida, so I mean, that's really yeah, close. I know. I might go to the beach later, so. Oh and this so baby Yoda, but that's actually my dog, so she's going to come get it. Okay. Oh, <laughs> well, I'm in Chicago, so I'm very, very jealous. <laughs> so, Patty, I wanted to talk a little bit about you, who you are. Um, we talked a little bit before. i recently came into the world of aerobatics. I'm learning a lot of who people are, what they're doing. And I, I've i read your book and I've learned a lot about you. I've, I've learned that you were a Hollywood stunt pilot. You were a former model in your past life. You were a shipwreck diver, which is pretty interesting. Certified flight instructor. I mean, and the list goes on and on and on. And you're also an air show performer. So um, you moved to the ranks pretty fast. In 1982, you had your first aerobatic flight. And at 85, you were on the U.S. aerobatic team. Can you walk us through your journey just a little bit of, um, you know, where your love of aviation began? Who inspired you? So um, I grew up around it. My dad was an airline pilot um, for Japan Airlines. And so, um, but I started flying with him on trips when I was really little, like five, six years old. And um, I loved it. And my mom always made sure that I loved it. You know, if I showed any fear. I remember getting on a big, you know, like a DC six or something for the first time when I was a kid. And I said, Oh, this is kind of scary. And she goes, don't be silly. This is just an airplane. And, uh, you know, she wouldn't let me have any fear. It was great. So my most fun moments as a kid were flying with my dad and, uh, we could sit in the cockpit in those days. And I'd always sit up in front with him. And as I got a little bit older, he'd let me fly. And um, so that they were the best times I had with him, you know, basically. Um, so I grew up around it there as a kid. I said I wanted to be a pilot and they said girls can't fly. The girls, you know, there were no opportunities for, for women anyway. And but it, it just never occurred to me that a woman couldn't do something. You know, I just never thought of things in terms of gender like that. Um, so I just you know, I didn't, I didn't learn to fly right away. I did other stuff. Um, and sorry, I'm clearing something on there annoying and took lesson. I moved to Alaska after living other places. Um, I was in my late twenties. I took lessons in Alaska and, um, and one thing led to another. I went to an air show and said, that's what I want to do. I'd never seen aerobatics. So I went and took lessons and just to make it short or else I'll go on forever. I know there's so much and I, I learned a lot about your your life in Alaska and you learned to fly a float plane which yeah is, what was that the yeah. first one you learned to fly in that was kind of one of the yeah that was the first small plane that I'd been in actually and then I um and then I had to charter a plane for my for my job and they crashed and uh I didn't get hurt and that's when I decided to learn to fly um after we after we crashed a small plane after I got you know survived the crash so yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i mean I, I know that um it's with, complicated right <laughs> yeah yeah i was gonna say like without i mean for those of you that have not read the book i know we were talking about possibly you writing another book which you should <laughs> but you should definitely read patty's book um i learned so much about her you flew a float plane decathlon pits so it's not you know you you've been in aviation for quite some time and you flew different um types of aircraft so i would like to you know learn more about you know, how you got into aerobatics, how you got into competition. Was that transition, um, is that a typical transition? I hear that from a lot of like air show pilots, they first started. Yeah, it is. Um, although I always tell people to um, get a good competition focused background. Um, and I, I practiced a lot and I learned a lot before, there were no contests in Alaska. 
And I joined IAC and I got the magazines and I started to learn what it was all about. But I actually flew air shows first because I was, um, you know, we're pretty isolated up there. So I flew a couple of small air shows and then I flew my decathlon down to the States, to Wisconsin, to compete, to see how I'd like it. And mm -hmm. I hated it. I hated the first one. I was like, I'm nervous. Air shows are more fun. I don't want to do this. And then I, but I stuck with it. And that was part of the big challenge was getting over being nervous and flying your best under pressure. So right. I like kept going with it. And I set different goals for myself. I decided um, I'm going to try and get on the U.S. aerobatic team. And then when I got on the team, what was my next goal? And I just kept changing my goals to, to where I wanted to be. And you attended your first air show, if I'm, if I'm right, in 1983 um, in Abbotsville? Yeah, in Abbotsford. I went okay. to yeah, I just went to see it and I went, that's, it just looked amazing to me. I love the flying. I love the, uh, watching the performers interact, you know, that, that to me was as much as fascinating as anything else, this whole sort of circus, you know, atmosphere. I always wanted to be in the circus and, you know, the flying circus atmosphere and the relationship with the performers, seeing you know, that they were all friends and, and, um, that appealed to me as much as anything. And I, I remember just feeling I was on the wrong side of the fence the whole time. Actually, that's a quote that I wrote down. Like you, you, you said that you were on the wrong side of the fence and, that um, you know, being an air show wife myself, I know that there's a lot that's involved in becoming an air show pilot. It's more than just flying the plane. There's a lot of like marketing that's involved. There's a lot of practices that it's involved. So yeah. for those that don't know you, um, can you describe your air show routine? Like what type of, what type of aircraft do you fly? What type of act? Well, yeah, I fly, I call it hardcore aerobatics. I fly about a 12 minute, 12 to 13 minute um, act of very just hardcore, you know, nonstop aerobatics. Um, I do an inverted ribbon cut, which is where um, two poles are held with the string ribbons going across it that's 22 feet above the ground and I cut it with my prop upside down. Um, I do some tumbles, I do a lot of precision aerobatics and I start right from takeoff and, and uh, fly, you know, pretty much nonstop. So, you know, the, the thing about an air show routine is um, you don't want to fly too long um, and you want people wanting a little bit more, but you have to give, you know, the show what they want. You have to fill some time too. Um, so choreography is really important. Um, and I watch other people's performances to see what their choreography is and what I can learn from them or what I don't want to do, you know? Um, I always feel like if it's too long, I sort of get, you know, start getting, you know, I mean, I have a pretty short attention span anyway, but um, so I, I choreography, it, you don't always have to be, you don't have to do the most spectacular things to mm -hmm. be a good air show pilot. You just have to choreograph it right, you know, and maybe have some good music or, you know, whatever it is that you do, whatever your style is going to be, but. Okay. I'm, and I'm sure there's a lot of mental focus that's involved, a lot of physical, um, you have to be physically fit. So can you tell me more about the mental and physical aspect of getting prepared for an air show? Cause it's not just like you, you go up in the air and you just perform, right? There's a lot on and off season that's involved. So first of all, yeah, physically, very much so. how do you stay physically fit? Yeah, well, I, I like to work out and I changed my workout a little bit in the summer and the winter because if I'm flying a lot, I don't have to do like upper body stuff as I do in the winter. And I do a lot of different things. Um, you know, I, I like interval training and yoga and riding my bicycle, swimming. And, you know, I'm just kind of an active person anyway. So it suits my lifestyle. Um, but, you know, I tell people it doesn't matter if you fly one show a year or 20 shows a year, you have to be in the same shape because that one show you have to be in shape for, you can't just go jump in the plane. You know, it's hard on you physically, the G's, um, when you roll upside down and the blood goes into your head and you, uh, you know, you're dealing with that, you're dealing with the, the strength issues or with the muscle memory, um, all that stuff. So you have to be in the same shape. So it really doesn't matter how many shows you fly. During COVID, you know, I flew one show last year um, yeah. in, it was like in November, I flew a one day, little one day show. And uh, it was the only one I flew, which is really unusual for me. I usually fly a lot of shows. And, um, but I really had to work toward it a lot. I had to build up to it. I had to make sure I was in shape. And it was interesting, you know, and I really came to that conclusion that it doesn't matter how many you fly, you know, you have to be, you have to approach it with the same mental discipline and physical discipline. Oh yeah, absolutely. Cause I've seen, you know, my, my husband's constantly working out and he's constantly trying different routines. He's like, I got to, you know, 
I got to lose weight because the aircraft, the G's puts more, um, I guess yeah. on your body. <laughs> so I was like, it does. Yeah. but I get it. It's a safety thing as well. Um, and mentally like before a show, like he's like, okay, get out of my space. I'm like, okay, do you have any routine that you have? Um, I didn't think my, there's very few people. I have a few people that group for me, friends that, um, if they sit in the car with me, they don't bother me, but anybody else, you know, and they know when to leave me alone. And, you know, it's funny, like we flew the Battle Creek show together. Yeah. And um, uh, a guy that I know, a friend of mine wanted to come and uh, come to the show. And they said, well, where, where are you going to hang out? And I said, well, we just really sit in our cars and sit in the air conditioning next to the planes and watch what's going on and watch the other pilots and be ready to fly. And he's like, you sit in your cars? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's what we do. And, um, they, you know, they think we sit in some glamorous, like, you know, motor home or something, right? And um, yeah. so I remember sitting there in front of my plane, I think I was pretty close to the runway. And I looked back and there's Rob Holland right behind me. And then Bob Carlton behind me in another car, uh, Bob and Lori. And then I think it was you guys. And then yeah. it was and we're, we're like sled dogs. I felt like we we're sled dogs, right? Mm-hmm. And all in our cars, air conditioned, just sitting on the line. That's what we do, right? It is. And it's like, I never understood it. You know, people don't understand how important our cars are. Sometimes you go to a show and they're like, you can't take your cars out to your planes and everybody revolts. Everybody has a fit. So yeah, because you're in the elements, you're in the heat, you know, you do want to interact with the crowd. Crowd interaction is a big but component. In, in time, in its right, right time. Yeah, you can't be constantly bombarded. Right, absolutely. And that's something that took me a while to learn as like, um, you know, a supporter and, and a wife. I'm just like, oh, okay, this is this is some serious stuff. Like, it's not uh, yeah. like, just get in his plane, like mentally, you know, he has to be there. And like, I had to learn those, you know, cues. I'm like, okay, <laughs> let me just be quiet. <laughs> It took me, but it, I mean, being into, I think we've been together and I always mess this up. He's going to kill me. Our anniversary is coming up, but I'm like, it took me a while to figure out. And I'm like, oh, okay. Everyone's doing this. So yeah, it's, it's interesting <laughs> to see it from the other side. Um, it's really just, interesting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And even diet, right? So diet's a big component of be, being an air show pilot too, because um, Patrick doesn't eat before flying. He's like, well, you tell me, he's like, stop telling me to eat. So is there any like certain foods that you eat? Um, I, I usually eat something before I fly myself, but you know, we're all different. And um, right. I, I like something kind of carby, you know, a little carby before I fly. It okay. helps kind of gives me more G tolerance. Um, and <laughs> I don't drink any, I don't need anything that's like pizza or anything, you know, gassy or anything like that Ew. and then um I don't drink any kind of carbonated drinks it's just water iced tea or something like that and um yeah yeah I mean you have to you have to make it work for you yeah. <laughs> Crack- crackers usually I'll go to the store when I get there you know to a show like Thursday or Friday and pick up bananas and some crackers maybe some granola bars and just stuff I can keep there in case there's no food around sometimes usually they try and feed you but it's not always easy to get or it's not what you want Right. They do a really great job of trying to, you know, keep you hydrated, focus. The volunteers do such a great shot job. The earth, you know, it's sure. amazing how much they do, you know, but sometimes it's not what you want. Right. Yeah, it depends. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your achievements. Um, so you received the Sword of Excellence, the Bill Barber Award, the Na- you're also a National Aviation Hall of Famer, um, and the list goes on and on. I want to ask you personally, is there... Um, you know, for, from becoming an aerobatic champion to a Hall of Famer, famer is there one goal or, um, I guess, award that you received that you're most proud of? That's a good question. I, um, you know, I didn't go into this to win awards, right? That's not when I started. I, I did change my goals as I got, you know, of what I wanted to accomplish once I started. You know, I got on the team. That was my accomplishment. And then I wanted to do well. And then I decided I wanted to be the first woman to win the nationals because um, all the guys were saying a woman can do it for some unknown reason. And um, I never could figure that one out. So I, um, that's, I'm really proud of winning the nationals um, and being the first woman to win it. That's my, that's to me, that's the most important achievement. And the other things um, that I won, um, you know, I'm really proud of, and especially, I mean, being in the national aviation hall of fame is amazing and everything, everything that people, give you and they want to honor you with is, is, um, is pretty incredible, you know, but I think the, the things that I've achieved on my own by doing something like the winning a a contest is 
the most valuable to me, you know. Well, but yeah. it's also nice to have a legacy, you know, and that if you're in the Hall of Fame, you know, you're going to be part of this legacy, aviation legacy for a long time. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I heard your plane, well, I don't know if it moved, um, was next to Amelia Earhart's. It was, yeah. And then it went out in the hallway and it was hanging upside down and it's going to go back in the hallway. They're redoing the National Air and Space Museum on the mall. And then they, um, they're they redoing the hallway and they're going to put it up again. So it's going to be really a neat spot. So That yeah. is so cool. I've been asking my husband to take me there, but, you know, we've been so busy with our schedules. So that's- hey, You need to go wait, wait for a little longer till they finish the refurbishment. They're, they okay. really redid the whole museum down the mall. It hadn't been really updated since the 70s. So- um, okay. So it's going to be amazing. Oh, gosh, I can't wait. I mean, I've, I've been immersed in aviation. I've been learning. Like, I interviewed the Tuskegee Airmen um, at Oshkosh. I've been following the WASP, uh, Women Air Force Service Pilots. Like, for me personally, I've been in aviation all this time. And I'm like, I'm just learning at 42 years old, <laughs> like, all the amazing things that aviation has to offer. And I feel it like... Does, yeah. And you could go to the Hasi Center now because that's not under... Um, it's a it's out at Dulles. It's easy to get to because if you just fly into Dulles and go and there's hotels around, of course, and and uh, it's beautiful. It's just beautiful. And then go to the one on the mall when it's when it's finished. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. Any recommendations? Send my way, and then I'll we're there. <laughs> you know, you'll go back. I mean, you'll you'll go there the first time. They have a they have a very um, great. They have a excellent display of air show airplanes there too. Oh, I love them. And my favorite's the pits. So obviously I'm partial to the pits, which so see, the first thing you see is Betty Skelton's pits uh, upside down as you walk through the doors. Ah, uh, it's a hockey center. It's called Little Stinker. And that was her pits. And that's the first thing you see when you walk in. Leo wow. Slager's plane is there. Bebo Howard, um, uh, Al Williams, uh, Susanna Oliver's um, mystery uh, travel air. Um, mm -hmm. is there that she did sky riding in for years and um, so there's there's quite a good display of, of aerobatic planes plus Bob Hoover's plane oh yeah I I didn't get a chance to meet him but I've heard so much about him through Patrick I know he was an inspiration for him as many um, yeah. you were an inspiration as well that's why I'm like I gotta talk to you <laughs> so it's like there's so many moguls in the, the industry it's like I'm on this journey that I feel like is going to be never ending <laughs> Oh, it is. It's totally never ending. Yeah. Which is amazing. I want to briefly talk about the pits um, in your book. I'm going to quote it. I know it's an old book. Um, you said that the pits is the most powerful, fantastic, certified aerobatic plane. <laughs> Do you still feel that way? Because I know well, you was at the time. Um, <laughs> and then I switched to monoplanes, but I love flying the pits. I own four different pits and I just kept working my way up to more and more powerful ones. But, you know, they're so small and they have yeah. so much power to weight you know, they, they do have more power to weight than any of the monoplanes do anyway. I mean, it's like one to one almost, you know, you get an 800 pound plane mm -hmm. and a 400 pound engine. So it's one to one. It's, yeah. it's, well, it's not, it's, it's based on horsepower, but it's almost that. So it's, it's like two to one. It's pretty amazing. It's a, it's an incredible little airplane. Yeah. I love the pits. <laughs> So does Patrick. That's why I always like to bring it into the pits because, you know, yeah. I feel like a lot of uh, the women that I've talked to, they, they've, uh, maybe everyone has flown to pits, but like, I like to hear like, okay, have you flown to pits? And they say, it's usually like wearing it, like, as I think it was Jackie Warda that told me, like, it's like you wear it as, as a sleeve on your body, like the pits. Oh, are yeah, you really do. Yeah. Which is I really interesting. That. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Cause it's yeah. Fun. And every, every landing is a challenge, you know? Yeah. And, I, mean, I flew a pits across the country. I didn't have a radio. I only had an hour and a half of fuel and um, didn't even have a compass, you know, the first year I did it. And I just, I flew it coast to coast and I'd follow railroad tracks and, you know, it was, it was amazing experience. I'm so glad I had that experience. It was before GPS, before Loran, before any of that stuff. You so, really were. Real pilotage. Yeah. Real and in the West, I found, I found these Bill, I was flying low most of the time too, and there weren't as many rules, you know, that was like late 80s and um, mid to late 80s. And there, I, I found in the Midwest, I found these uh, old um, signs for the airmail pilots back in the 20s. So they would have an arrow on top of a, a farm, or like a barn, pointing uh -huh. to the airport, and it had the dis distance like 1.2 or something miles, and it would point that direction. And that was one of the ways that they navigated. And I found some of those. That is crazy. I can't imagine learning to fly. Like, I mean, I want to, but like without navigation. And that's what Patrick wants to do. He's like, I'm yeah. going to do it the right way. 
<laughs> yeah, you don't need any of that stuff. Yeah, it's just, I just got to work up the nerve, which I'm getting there. I've been in a decathlon, a, a cub, a pits. So uh, it's just getting exposed to that. So yeah. I'll get there. Just you getting to that. Like it. it's, and it's not for everybody. Right. Yeah. I mean, I love it so much. And I just, you know, it's just the fear of you know, just getting over the fear. I'll get there. I'll get there. <laughs> and if you don't, it's okay. Yeah. You know? Yeah, absolutely. There's a lot to offer in aviation, even if you don't fly, it doesn't really matter. Right. Yeah. Like I've been in aviation all my life. I've been ground support. I've been airport operations. Um, the same thing. It has to be everybody. Right. Not yeah. everybody can fly. Yeah. Um, I did want to talk about gender roles. Um, and again, going back to quotes, because Patrick's like, you're such a quoter. Um, you mentioned aviation is the greatest equalizer. No matter who you were, rich or poor, male or female, there's equality at the yoke and in the cockpit. Yeah. Um and I actually, I absolutely love that quote that actually, you know, resonated with me, but you also dealt with in the same hand, a lot of criticism and antiquated forms of thinking. Um, how did you overcome that along your journey of becoming a world champion? You know, I used it to, to give myself more uh, focus and to overcome it. And, you know, I'm that kind of person. If you say, I can't do something, I want to do it more. And so I just used it to prove them wrong. I just had that, you know, I, I kept trying to tap into that anger that you have, you know, when you're about 18 years old and you just want to punch a wall yeah. and, you're just angry and you have all this built up stuff and hormones and all these things going on. I just kept trying to tap into that like rage of being a teenager and, um, and like, you know, telling myself, you know, this, and, and I also tried to educate people along the way. My, my big focus was educating in a really nice way with a sense of humor. You know, you'd hear something, some stupid sexist comment and say, well, you know, let's look at it this way, you know, try and point people in the right direction. I think you can do it in a really nice way without being, I mean, there are times you just get sick of it, but you know, if you can maintain your sense of humor and all that along the way, it, it's helpful. And, and really just try and show people that really it doesn't matter. You know? Right. No, absolutely. I think we've all as females felt that and it's, there comes a point you just, you, you, you don't get, accept it, but um, you get so sick of it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you adapt. You should stand up and not say, and not just, you know, take it and be funny, you know, or go, oh, you guys, you know, but um, sometimes you do have to. Right. You know, and I've seen a shift, um, you know, with gender roles recently, although, you know, we're not where we need to be, but I have seen a lot of like change. So I, I think that it's, it's good that change is happening, although slow, but it's, it's happening. So I just wanted to ask you, I'm like, oh, how did you overcome that? Because it was different back in your time too, um, which I'm sure it was harder. So I guess so. I, I, um, I just, I never saw myself as, I just saw myself as a pilot, you know, and it was sort of the way other people saw me. So it didn't affect how I saw myself and my abilities, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. Definitely an inspiration. Um, I want to talk about giving back to the community. Um, and I know, I'm not sure if you're still doing this. Um, Kenya, you're, are you still involved in Kenya? And can you talk a little bit yeah. about your journey there? Uh, so yeah, since 2001, um, we've been um, we've had a program to give um, training to the Kenya Wildlife Service pilots. Um, they patrol all of the airports, all, all the national parks in Kenya for, um, and one of their main focus is poaching, elephant poaching, rhino, you know, et cetera, everything else. Um, and, and they back then, so this is brought to my attention by um, a, another guy that's involved in international wildlife and also a pilot. And, he said, why don't you come over in your off season and we'll do a training program. Mm -hmm. And at first I was a little hesitant. I didn't know what it would be like. And I went and it was fantastic. And we love the pilots and they're all from different areas of Kenya, different tribes and so on. And um, they were having a lot of accidents. So I think that we really helped with their, um, with their safety and the accident rate went down. So I've been doing that. Um, I've been there ten times with you know wow. doing training programs, and I was supposed to go this year, but you know with COVID everything's delayed. We might go next year. Um, I bring another instructor or two with me, and uh, we spend a week and fly a lot. Last time, in nineteen, I brought two friend, two really good friends, instructors. One was a girlfriend, which was really fun to have another woman there because wow. it's always me and the guys, right? So we had a blast and, uh, and everybody loved her and it was great. And I had two fantastic instructors. And between the three of us in five days, we flew, it was um, like 
I think 90 flights, something ridiculous. Wow. Yeah. And each one of us had one day, one off day where we didn't feel that great. You know, the time change and the food and yeah. good, but I mean, it's just, you know, differences and stuff. So we got a lot done and we fly Huskies, Super Cubs, 180 and some other planes. I love and Super Cub. <laughs> sure that they're doing things right. Work. So some people want to transition to another plane. Some people, we just have to make sure they're, you know, they're safe and we give them upset training and it's been good. It's been really one of the most rewarding things, you know, that I've done. And I've gotten to see all of Kenya, lots of animals, been to a lot of national parks, flown all over the place. It's been amazing. Oh my gosh. And, and it's a great cause. I mean, not only are you giving back, but you're saving um, wildlife and animals. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. it's really important because the poaching is so bad. So yeah, and I know we definitely want to get involved. So anything you need from us, let us know because um, that's a, a cause that's near and dear to both of our hearts. So definitely let me know. <laughs> um, travel. I know your logbook became your diary. Yeah. <laughs> Reading your book. What is your um, <laughs> what is one of your um, most memorable or favorite places that you've been through throughout the course of your? I know you started. You were in Japan. You were in Switzerland. So you were kind of all across the globe. So is there one country that resonates the most with you? I love Australia and I love Kenya. Um, but I, I had I had a really good experience in Australia. I moved there with my first husband. And uh, we traveled up the West Coast in a boat and then we drove around the country and I took a train across the bottom part. And I just, you know, I kind of grew up there, you know, and um, I went there when I was really young and um, kind of grew up um, and um, ended up living in Queensland and Brisbane and had a great job that I liked. And I didn't fly yet, but, um, okay. but I learned a lot and had some great friends and it was just a great experience for me. And I really fell in love with the country. Just oh the gosh. terrain, the ocean, the, the desert. I mean, it's just a most amazingly beautiful place. And um, and the animals there are amazing too, you know. I, so. I, I can't imagine. You've made I mean, I it just sounded so beautiful. I've been wanting to travel there. I'm like, oh it's my so gosh. amazing. And um, I miss it. I want to go back. I have some friends that I need to see. And so um, I really, really feel something about Australia, you know. Oh yeah, no, I any type of country you go to outside, I mean, obviously the U.S. is, you know, I was born and raised here, but I think traveling across the world definitely changes your perspective on a lot of things on life. Yes, yeah. very much so. It's important to travel. Oh yeah, absolutely. So it's just amazing that you've had that opportunity at such a young, young age. And obviously your father worked for, you know, Japan Airlines, yeah. but um, that's amazing. My mom works for American Airlines. So we've been traveling ever since I was like, Oh, nice. <laughs> so I'm a non rev baby. Yeah. <laughs> Grew up in aviation myself. So it's pretty a cool. Voice travel for sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, about your past. Um, so I just want to talk if you had a time machine, right? I'm all about like scientific thinking and yeah, I'm into like comic books. If you had a time machine and you can go back to the past, any moment in your past, um, is there one piece of advice you would give your younger self? or what that would be? That's a good question. I don't know. I would probably say, don't take everything so seriously, but then, you know, you kind of are who you are. Um, and yeah, there, there's probably a lot of things. I There's okay. some things I wouldn't do differently. And of course, you know, on a personal level, there's lots of things you do differently, but, um, but you know, I've really followed my own path and I think that's important. Um, I think it's really important to follow what makes you happy and where your path should lead. And it's not always easy and you do make sacrifices. And um, there are times you, you know, I don't know if you question it because I, I really don't ever question my path because I'm, I guess you do. I, it's hard to explain, but um, I would say follow your path. And even though it's not always easy, just keep keep on what you know, you know, the path that you're supposed to be. I call it like this golden path. You just stay on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people fall off to the wayside and some people, you know, are still there and you just stay on it, you know, and if you can do that and you're living your, you're living your destiny and that's what you need to do. Yeah. That's a good piece of advice for your younger self. <laughs> There's so many things I want to tell my younger self. And I'm like at the point where I'm like, oh, you know what? I'm proud of my journey. Although yeah. it's, you know, a long and long road that I went down, but, you know, we eventually find ourselves, which is great. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, you know, you have to try a lot of things and do different things. You have to make mistakes. And, you yeah. know, if you don't, you're le leading a pretty boring life. Yeah. You know, you're very, yeah, you're not getting out, out of that comfort zone. Yeah, absolutely. Take, um, advantage, but, take advantage of opportunities is another thing because they don't always come around the second time. No. Yeah, you're yeah. absolutely right. Yeah. People think a lot. I don't, I, I've jumped into things, you know, in the past. Um, and, it's good you know i'm glad i did because i took advantage of something and took me in a different direction mm -hmm. but that opportunity wouldn't have come around again yeah oh yeah which is another question i had if you weren't fair you know i know aerobatics changed your life you said that aerobatics changed your life um if not for flying what do you think you would be doing i don't know i thought about that i mean i love the idea of being a race car driver or something like that but i didn't have that opportunity i wasn't around drivers you know and okay. you kind of tend to follow in the footsteps of your family because you're exposed to it at a young age and it's a comfortable place to be so that's why there's so many pilots or children of pilots or actors or have actor parents and so on um okay. so i don't know you know i i think i could have been good at um other things but that's a hard one i don't think it would be as fulfilled you know it wouldn't have been as fun yeah <laughs> sounds like you definitely are having fun up there when i see you performing uh, yeah. oh my gosh how did she do it I, like i'm in awe of all performers even my husband i'm like uh, <laughs> that's amazing what you guys like calling you know it's like you see it and you're like i have to do that and yeah really explain it yeah, it's, it's definitely, I've asked people to explain it. And I know it's, it's, it's a hard feeling to explain when you're up in the air and doing those loops and rolls and aerobatics. It's like, it's crazy. But the, the desire to do it and the desire to be an air show pilot is something that's, it's, it's something internal and yeah. that you either have it or you don't kind of thing, you know, yeah. and the people that do it, you can't really explain why. It's just like, that's, that's what I'm going to do. That's the way I felt when I went to my first air show. Ah. Um, and you ask any of the performers, they, you know, kind of like rob holland you know he he yeah. knew what he wanted to do when he was very young and asked people advice and he did it and yeah got to where he is you know yeah no that that's that's amazing um i'm getting near of my little interview but i have some on the fly questions and i want you to just answer the first moment that like or answer that pops in your head okay um so the first one is i'm not sure if you're still into poetry your favorite poet Oh, um, gosh, uh, Robinson Jeffers. Okay. If you were to choose one, snow or beach? Beach. City beach. or country? Favorite country? City oh. or country? City life or country life? What was it? Oh, um, that's a hard one. That's a hard one. Country life, I think. Okay. Uh, camping or resort? Resort, no question. Really? <laughs> I'd pay you for a camper. <laughs> All right, I asked this earlier, but pits are extra. <laughs> That's a hard one. Extra, I'd have to say. Okay. okay. Well, because he's flying extra. <laughs> you yeah. have to the one you're with, right? You know, so you to. I get it. Um, favorite mode of travel: plane, train, boat. Um, plane, of course. <laughs> I love trains, though. Do you? Yeah, because I, I heard you were at, yeah, I read you were on a train and you went across the country. So I, I've done that when we went to Italy when I was a kid and that was amazing. Oh, that must have been great. I'd love to take a train around Italy. That's something I really want to do. Yeah, it's, it's, you have to do it when things get back to normal. Um, Italy, yeah. and you've been to Colombia, I, I know. So yeah, um, just to Cartagena, which I love, love, I love. Go back. <laughs> I want to go so badly too. I just, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you can go now, you know, you can go with being vaccinated is easy. Yeah, yeah it is. Oh, absolutely. Um, and then, okay, I know I said it was the last one, but what is a must pack item in your plane? If you were to pack three items, you're limited to just three items. What are the three items that you would pack? You're going to an air show, you're going to perform, go. <laughs> Definitely my cell phone um, and uh, my Swiss army knife hmm. um, and my lipstick. I like that. <laughs> I have that. Yeah. Yeah, lipstick. <laughs> My red one. Um, well, I wanted to thank you for um, taking the time to speak with me. This was a really fun I interview. You. I really appreciate it. I'll have a different screensaver next time. No, I love that one. And um, <laughs> your sponsors, I know that sponsors make 
an air show performer. Um, they keep you up in the air. Do you want to, you know, throw out a, a pitch for your sponsors before we? Yeah, actually, can I, I'll throw out a pitch for um, a company I'm working with to produce videos. And we just came out with our first series of videos. It's basic aerobatics course with Sporties. So okay. Sporty, Sporties Pilot Shop. And you can get those online, go to Sporties. And we're producing the second video now. It's called Tailwheel, how to, you know, tailwheel rating, tailwheel checkout. And uh, it's going to be very, very comprehensive, pretty detailed, uh, lots of amazing footage. The guys just got back from Alaska and they shot a friend of mine landing on glaciers up there and, uh, and tundra and stuff like that. So um, okay. that'll, that'll come out in sometime in November before Christmas. So um, sporty's pilot shop videos. So. Cool. And then you also have a school if people want to learn to fly, right? Uh, it's, um, it's in St. Augustine, Florida. And um, it's just, um, you can go to our website, pattywagstaff.com and learn all about the school. And we teach airmanship and basic aerobatics and um, advanced coaching. I have a student here this week from the UK that I've been working with all week and, um, and giving him more advanced training. So it's been really fun. And really, is- fun. really good instructors. Um, and yeah, I do some of it, but, but my instructors do a lot of it. And so it's been, it's been amazing and, and fun. And we've met the best people. We have the best students. So that is amazing. And we have a box you. right here too. So I can coach people right here from my office. By the ocean. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Actually, it is over the water, but it's not quite as blue. I love St. Augustine. We went there. My, my brother lives in Jacksonville. So we drove there. I'm like, oh my gosh, I want to move here. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a good place to live. It is. I've lived here for a while. It's a really, it's a little small town, you know, but yeah, there's a, a lot of history place. though. A lot of history there. Yeah which I love. Well, Patty, thank you. You are a true Wonder Woman of Aviation. And for those of you listening, make sure that you follow Patty. Go to her um, school if you want to learn aerobatics. Reach out to her. And thank you for listening to the Wonder Woman of Aviation. Thank you. Until next time. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, please share it with others or post about it on social media.